The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you everyone for joining us today. The webinar will begin at the top of the hour in one minute. Again, the webinar will begin in one minute. Hi again, everyone. Thank you for joining. The webinar will begin in one minute at the top of the hour. Again, we will begin in one minute. Thank you. Good day and welcome to this Health Catalyst webinar. As a quick introduction, Health Catalyst is a next generation data, analytics software, and decision support company committed to being a catalyst for massive sustained healthcare improvements. My name is Sarah Stokes and I will be your moderator today. Now let us begin with today's webinar, Using Analytics to Increase Cash Flow, presented by Greg Stock, President and Chief Executive Officer at Thibodeau Regional Medical Center, along with Mickey Fazio, Director, Him and Clinical Documentation Improvement. Greg joined Thibodeau Regional in 1990, and the organization has experienced significant growth under his results-oriented leadership. Under his reign, the medical center has reached a significantly higher level of performance, resulting in the organization being recognized as an innovative leader in healthcare. Mickey has more than 12 years of experience in the health information management field and currently oversees all aspects of the completion, availability, accuracy, and protection of the clinical information within the health record. Her work includes ensuring timely coding and managing discharge, not final build cases. Throughout today's webinar, you will be presented with multiple poll questions. We encourage you to engage in those polls as they will help to drive today's conversation forward. We also urge you to submit questions by using the questions pane in your GoToWebinar control panel. Greg and Mickey will answer questions at the end of the presentation in a questions and answers session. We are recording today's webinar and shortly after the event, you will receive an email with links to the recorded on-demand webinar, the presentation slides and a transcript. Also, you can follow us on social media. Our handle is at Health Catalyst. I will now turn the time over to Greg. Greg. Hello everybody, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And <clears throat> we're excited about what has happened here at Thibodeau Regional through the use of uh, improved analytics and process improvement and leadership. And, you know, today, in today's world, uh, cash flow is such an important matter for virtually any healthcare institution. The Thibodeau Regional Medical Center is a 185-bed facility located down in the swamps and bayous of South Louisiana that, um, you know, I grew up in Arizona, so it was quite a cultural change for me to come down here a number of years ago, but really a great place. Um, we're a service district hospital, which is equivalent to a county hospital, but we uh, work very diligently to try to uh, consistently improve and to achieve as close to perfection as we can in the things that we do all across the board. And uh, I think the culture of our organization is, which we won't talk too much about, helps us uh, significantly be able to, to move the dial to improve. Now, today we want to talk a little bit about top financial challenges that hospitals face. Uh, some of the common strategies for improving financial performance um, and maybe focus in a little bit on discharge, not final build, how we, how we attack that, how we implemented an improvement process there, and how we, in, in part of that, that effort, um, assess the opportunities for improvement using analytics and process improvement, and then some of the results that, uh, that we were able to achieve that are, that are continuous, they're more permanent. That's important to us that we establish a, a change that is not, you know, the flavor of the day, as it said, and six months later, you're back where you started from. So that's what we'd like to discuss with you all today.
Okay. Um, Sarah, can you advance the slide? I think uh, maybe at this point you wanted, we right on the front end wanted to find out if there were, uh, you know, poll, poll questions, any kind of questions people would want to try to address during this presentation. All right, we're kicking off the presentation with two poll questions here. And I'm gonna go ahead and launch this first one. And so we would like to know, how familiar are you with your facility's discharge not final build process? Your options are one, unfamiliar, maybe you're not aware if you even have a DNFB process. Two, you're somewhat familiar, you know that you have a DNFB process, um, but maybe you're not sure of the details there. Three, you're very familiar, you're involved in that process. And four, you're unsure or it's maybe not applicable. What is a DNFB? Those votes are coming in fast here. Looks like everybody's on the ball this Wednesday. <laughs> okay, they're starting to slow down a little bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll here and share the results. Okay, wow. so 41% said they're unfamiliar. So it looks like you got you know your work cut out for you today to uh, talk about this DNFB process. 19% said somewhat familiar, 16% reported very familiar, and 24% were unsure or not applicable. Okay. All right, so it looks like we have about over 60% that are not familiar at all with the DNFB process. So we'll just, we'll explain it prior to going into our process changes. All right, we'll hide the results of that poll. And then we actually have one more poll before we really get into the meat of this. So let me pull that one up for us here. So in this poll, we'd like to know what is your facility's greatest challenge as it relates to DNFB accounts? So, you know, maybe if you're not sure, this is gonna be a little bit tougher for you, but your options here are one, incomplete physician documentation, two, coding turnaround time, three, billing or insurance issues, four, some other problem, and five, unsure or not applicable. Again, maybe you're not totally sure what this DNFB process is all about. Okay, and the votes are still coming in. They're, they are still continuing to come in. I'll just make one more statement of remember to submit your questions as we go throughout the presentation today. Mickey and Greg are gonna be ready to roll with those at the end of the presentation. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and close that poll and share the results. So we had 28% reported incomplete physician documentation. So aside from that unsure or not applicable, which we had 48% of the audience there, that's our majority is incomplete physician documentation. 6% reported coding turnaround time. 15% reported billing or insurance issues and 4% reported other. Does that line up with what you kind of would have expected, Mickey, or did you think people might fall into a specific uh, bucket there? Um, incomplete physician documentation, I definitely suspected that would be the highest. Um, that's definitely our highest as well. So, All right. Yep. I will hide those results, and then I will turn the time back to both you and Greg. Okay. I'm going to do a little more <laughs> introduction of Thibodeau Regional Medical Center. Thibodeau Regional is a 185-bed hospital, as I mentioned, located in South Louisiana. It's about an hour southwest of New Orleans, uh, literally down in the swamps and bayous. Hurricane country, um, a lot of very powerful storms come through here. And uh, over the years, we've tried to build into this hospital, just on that note, capability to endure hurricanes. And it's not the subject of the day, but it's part of the culture and part of how we run the place. Now all the other hospitals in the region close and leave and we stay during these hurricanes. So that's the reflection on our, our culture. So we use a term called patient-centered excellence. Patient-centered excellence has been around here since 2000, 2001. And then we apply it to all aspects of, of care. And the results have been like in the Tuscany system at the very top in the five areas that we measure patient satisfaction and others like health grades, you know, the 11 years in a row and the outstanding patient experience awards. Uh, one of the 
challenges for all of us is how to, to recruit and retain and create a great atmosphere, a great place for people to work, have a system they believe in and, and people can feel like they're contributing. And we measure that with Press Ganey and our employee engagement and satisfaction scores. The last five times we've measured them, which are about 18 month intervals, <clears throat> have been the top 5%. So we think we're a leader in quality. We've in initiated care, care transformation teams that are led by physicians, supported by analytics. And we've been able to um, you know, see some real improvements. These are, these are things everybody's pursuing, but these are pretty significant improvements using process improvement, analytics, physician teams, and setting clear expectations. And that's another subject, but all part of our culture and who we are. We implemented Six Sigma in 2000 and Lean in 2001. We do a lot more Lean today than Six Sigma. And so um, that's a little bit there about our hospital. In addition, in addition, even though we have a pretty stable population, it's not fast growing, about 2% per five years. Um, you know, we recruited 100 doctors. Now we do pretty well, honestly, with our heart programs, our spine center, Cancer Center. And if you want to move the slides there, Sarah, I'll just show a, uh, I kind of covered that slide. If you go on to the next slide, I don't want to bore people with all these things on background too much, but what you see there is an image of the Cancer Center we're building, five, five story, 100,000 square foot building. We just let the bids on it. So it's two years from now, everything goes well. You can move the next, go to the next slide. Um, it will, you know, you'll see that facility on the left. Now, to go to the next slide, <laughs> we'll share with you a little bit about something exciting that we've done. It's, it's wellness. We built a, it's a 250,000 square foot wellness center. In this area, it's really innovative and maybe for a lot of places, size and scope of it is pretty significant. And there's been over a, a million people uh, use the wellness center in the first 18, 24 months of operation. There's great things we think we're doing in community. Some of them are simple things like putting playground equipment in nine or 10 of the schools right around us to lots of education uh, opportunities and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'll, I'll end this on this, and that is integrating wellness into clinical care with our physicians has really been, I think it's innovative and I think it's really the future. Next slide. So this is a bird's eye view of the phase two of the wellness center that was also just bid out. 12 tennis courts, four sand volleyball courts, a turf field with all NCAA requirements there to track and field tur turfs and so forth. So that for this community in this region, it's gonna be really nice. Uh, it, it, it expresses all the things that we want to express about wellness that engages the little university here, Nickel State University. We'll be holding, you know, tennis uh, <clears throat> tennis tournaments here. Uh, as an example, um, the, the Manning Passing Academy is held right next to this site. We have a great relationship with the Mannings, and uh, so there's a lot of interaction there with our sports medicine program. And um, so that's, that's kind of a little bit about us. Okay, why don't we get into the, a little bit of the details about what we think are number one issues for the <coughs> CEO. So how do, you, how do you fund the things I just talked to you about? That's, that's how you wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning, every morning trying to figure that out. Because actually, in many different ways, reimbursement is <clears throat> is declining, more and more difficult to get paid, and there's a lot of rising costs in healthcare. The bids came in on this this cancer center probably 30% higher than all the cost projections were. We just gave big adjustment to our nurses in our area. There's shortage of nurses, pretty significant one. How do you cover those costs? The change in payer mix has occurred in Louisiana as the Medicaid volumes have gone up, the bad debt's gone up, and the, the uh, commercial payers' volumes have gone down. When you 
put those things together, what it spells is a, is a negative bottom line. And we're not there yet, but our hospital next to us losing six to 10 million a year, 300 bed hospital. Uh, when that happens year after year, that gets to be an issue. And most of them are there. So if you don't have cash reserves, then how are you going to go forward? And that's kind of where ownership changes take place. So documentation and coding issues are not kind of notorious, and there's lots of reasons why they're important, including the, being able to document and accurately for quality purposes and reimbursement. Um, <clears throat> on denials, you know, recently here, the uh, Blue Cross and others just implemented uh, a procedure where every readmission was a denial, and then we had to come back and try to get paid for it. There's lots of regulatory and compliance requirements that are incredible. They, many of them really constitute cuts in reimbursement and delays in payment, in addition to all the uh, hoops they make you jump through. And I already mentioned bad debt. So those are some of the financial matters facing CEOs today. Go to the next slide, Sarah. So here's some, you know, these are pretty well-known strategies. Uh, improving the documentation and coding, uh, reducing the number of outstanding bill hold accounts, reducing AR days has been around forever, and better managing the discharge, not final bill cases is, you know, it's there. So you'll turn one more slide and then I'm gonna turn the time over to, to Mickey. Um, <clears throat> at our hospital, we, we've worked diligently over the years, we have no debt. So we're not making debt payments, interest payments on anything. That puts us in you know, a pretty good position. We have 350 to 60 days of cash on hand, which is about four times the average in Louisiana. And, you know, but our AR days, 43, the time this was done are still better than the standard and poor's AA top rated hospitals, but not where we wanted to be. The delinquency rate that was not necessarily either where we wanted to be, and $4 million in discharge, not final bill. But that's cash sitting out there that we could take and apply to recruiting new physicians, you know, building cancer centers programs, all of that, paying our nurses, whatever it is that demands cash. And that's kind of where we are. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to Mickey to talk to you about how we <coughs> All right, hi guys. So this is um, Mickey. I am the HIM director and um, CDI director. And first of all, I'm just going to explain what the DNFB is because we had over 60% of our um, viewers that did not know what D DNFB was. So um, Sarah, if you can go to the next slide. Okay, so the DNFB stands for Discharge Not Final Build, and what that is is the patient accounts that are discharged from the hospital, but they're not coded or billed yet for some reason. Uh, many times it's because we're waiting on documentation from a physician or we're waiting on a coder to code it. Um, in 2014, like Greg said, our DNFB was at $4 million. So that means that we had $4 million worth of accounts that could not be processed <clears throat> and could not be coded or billed. Um, in 2014, we, we saw that ICD-10 was coming and we knew that more specificity was going to be required. Um, and we knew that we wouldn't get the documentation timely. So we knew that would lead to our DNFB growing, um, you know, to 6 million. And we really didn't want that to happen. So we knew we had to look at the processes and make changes. Um, the first thing that we realized was that we had a very inefficient, time-consuming manual process for our DNFB. Basically, the way that we would find these accounts and figure out what was going on with them is that we would run this, this uncoded, unbilled account out of our um, EMR provider, which was Meditech. We would get a list of about 900 to 2,000 accounts, and we would import these accounts into uh, an Excel spreadsheet. From there, we'd have to go through each account and research why it wasn't coded. So basically, we would go into that account and see, okay, is it missing any documentation? Um, is it missing an operative report or a history and physical? Um, is it not coded because it's ready to code, but the coder is just backlogged and isn't able to code it yet? Um, 
once we figured that out, then we had to address each reason by either calling the physician and asking for that documentation, emailing the coders, um, calling a department if they hadn't sent in the, the orders or the documentation that we needed. And, and then we would calculate the financials and email everybody in the hospital that needed to see that. The problem with this is that it took us about eight hours to do this process. So we were only able to do this about every two weeks, um, which meant that things were sitting on there for two weeks at a time. Um, so we knew we needed to initiate an automated, efficient process. This manual process led to overburdened physicians and coders. So for the physicians, we would send them a list once every two weeks, and it would have, you know, 20 or so accounts, and we would say, um, we need you to document on these accounts. And a lot of times the doctors would come back and say, well, why, why wasn't I made aware of this sooner? You know, the patient's been gone for two weeks. It's going to be difficult to go back and document now. And it was because of our manual process. Also, um, accounts that were ready to code would sit on that list for two weeks without being coded because the coder was not aware they were ready. So the coder would wait on us to email them to say, hey, these are ready to code. Um, another bad thing about this is that the DNFB changes daily. As a patient's discharge, the DNFB is changing. So, so basically, if we would run the DNFB in the morning, by that afternoon, things were already changed. We may email the coders, these are ready to code, and the coder would come back and say, well, I coded those this morning. So, so it was a lot of rework and just a very manual process. So we knew that um, we needed to implement these real-time alerts. Um, the third thing that we found we had opportunity was that we were lacking analytics. So the data was unorganized. It was overwhelming to review. Like I said, it was a very manual process. We had no way to find patterns or to even find the main issues that were causing the delays in the coding. So we had an inability to be proactive and to put processes in place to avoid these delays. We wanted to see the data organized and sorted and filtered at the click of a button. Um, so basically, we wanted to spend less time organizing the data and more time targeting issues that the organized data brought to light. So we knew we wanted to implement an analytic system to find greater um, the greatest areas of opportunity. The next thing that we found was that we had an opportunity for innovation through a change in our department structure. So around this time, RAC was really ramping up. Um, insurance denials were just really piling up. We had ICD-10 coming. We had so much focus on coding. It, it was like everywhere we turned, it was focused on coding. Um, our current, our current at the time, department structure did not allow for this much, much focus on coding. We had a director who was over coding, clinical documentation improvement, DNFB, and the general HIM function of the department. So she really didn't have the time to put that much focus on the coding piece. So we knew that we had to restructure the department to allow that focus shift. And then finally, um, we had a lot of times where we were lower level coding. Um, we'd have weekly calls from the business office and they'd say, this account is going to be untimely by this date. If we don't get it coded by this date, then we're not going to get paid anything for this account. Um, when that would happen, we would have to code to a lower level of acuity so that we could at least get paid something for the account. Um, not good for the hospital because you don't get reimbursed fully and also not good for the patient because it doesn't show the true acuity level. So when that patient comes back in, you know, that chart is not accurate. So Sarah, next slide. So how did we improve? Number one, we invested in analytics. So Health Catalyst came in and we told them our vision. We said we wanted to spend less time organizing the data and more time um, putting action behind the data. Um, we wanted to be able to find the financials and the patterns within the data at the click of a button. Um, so what we did is we went through the processes one by one, and we really started to automate those processes. One thing that was very complicated with our situation is that we had half of our records were scanned and half were electronic. We had records within different systems that needed to be pulled um, into this application. So it was a little confusing to really sort through all of that. Um, and what we had to do is, well, what Health Catalyst did was build instructions within the system to basically tell it what to do, what we were doing manually. So, for example, um, it would check a certain desktop within Meditech. 
if the account was flagged for an incomplete operative report, it would bring that information onto the application. So at the click of a button, we could see this patient's account is missing an operative report. It also could check if conditions were met, and if all the conditions were met, it would say that the account was ready to code, which would then go onto a work list for the coders. So, so that's how we, we got through, through building the system. The next thing we did is we fine-tuned and verified the analytic data. So this was months, we spent months running the data, um, the old way, the manual way, and then the new automated way. And we would compare, and we did that over and over, and we brought any um, discrepancies to Health Catalyst to research, because we knew that before we shared that data with anybody, especially physicians, we wanted that data to be very accurate. And, and we really started to trust the data after a while. The third thing we did was we communicated consistently with physicians and key departments. So what this looked like was if we, when we ran the application, if we saw that an account was missing an order, we would contact that department and say, this account is missing an order. Can you send us this order? If we saw that every day of the week, we were having to call that same department for the order, that's a pattern. So then we look at that process and say, what's wrong with this process that we're not getting an order on a regular basis? Um, same thing with physicians. So, you know, if we saw there were patterns with physicians, if they were always missing an operative report or always missing some type of documentation, we could say, what's going on here? And we could work with that physician. So this is how we started to fix processes one by one and to be more proactive with our processes. Um, the next thing we did is we revamped our processes. So what this looked like was just meeting with the key people and um, that was involved with the DNSD and seeing what needed to be done daily, weekly, and monthly to meet our goals. So one example is this, is that the application recognizes when an account is ready to code. So for our coders, we tell them the first thing you do in the morning before you start your work list for the day, check the DNSD and, and code all of the accounts that are under your name that are ready to code. So that's something that needs to be done daily. Um, our physicians, we filter the application by physician and we send them that information twice weekly. Um, once we started using it, we really saw that we were getting continuous input from the front end users and getting some really impactful suggestions. Um, our most recent example would be, we started to notice that some of our orders coming in for outpatient testing had invalid diagnoses or they had no diagnoses on the actual order. And of course, we can't code from that. So um, one of our coders actually brought to our attention, can the application help us with this? How can, how can we use the application to help us? So we worked with um, Health Catalyst to bring in the info and it tracked if the order had an invalid diagnosis on it or had no diagnosis on it. Um, then we were able to filter and sort to see which physician's offices were consistently sending us orders that had no diagnosis on it. And then we were able to educate those physician offices. So it really helped us to be proactive in that situation. Um, and the last thing we did was we educated key departments on the DNFB application and gave access when appropriate. So sometime into this process, we realized that we could really lean this process out even further. We, um, so what we would do is we would sort the records and by physician, and then we would send to the office manager and say, hey, can you have this doctor um, look at this and complete these records? Well, then we started thinking, why don't we just give the office managers access to the application, the application, and then they can just handle their physicians on their own, on their, you know, on their own time. And so we, we discussed um, timeframes and everything with them, and we got them set up with that, and that's been working really well. So the last thing we did is we revised the department structure and created new roles. Um, we changed our executive leadership and we changed our department leadership. And we, we changed it to where our director was actually over clinical documentation improvement and DNFB. And then we created a coding management role, which was actually over the coding and the education piece. So that, that coding piece had uh, its own focus. And then we also brought in a DNFB specialist who uh, monitors the DNFB daily. She orchestrates all the communication between the physicians, the departments, and the coders, and she brings those patterns, like I was talking about, to my attention so we can address it with the department. Okay, Sarah, next slide. <clears throat> so this is a snapshot of our DNFB application, 
Um, if you notice right at the top, you can see at the click of a button, you can see how many charges are on the DNSB. So that used to take us a good eight hours to find, and now you can see it at the click of a button. Um, so some, to the left, these are some of the filters that we find very helpful during our workflow. Um, DNSB by aging. So we tell coders to sort oldest um, to most current and get those oldest accounts knocked off first. Um, you know, back in 2014, when we used to sort oldest to newest, we had some accounts on there that were one or two years old. And now I'm happy to say that the oldest we ever see is about a month. So um, that's really good. And then Dina V by location. So I can sort by location and see which departments are holding up or causing delays in coding. And then I can address that with that department. DNFB by charges. So if the coders have a really busy day, we tell them, you know, sort by charges, start with your highest charges, get those knocked out first. And then DNFB by coders. So if a coder is falling behind, um, we can see this on the application because they'll consistently have a large number of charges or a, a large amount of accounts. So Sarah, can we go to the next slide? So we've had excellent results. Um, for our AR days, which the AR days is the amount of days from discharge to when the claim is paid. And of course, the lower the better. Um, we went from 43.1 to 36.9. So we've had a 6.2 day reduction in AR days. Next slide. Delinquency rate, which is the amount of accounts that are incomplete that do not have required documentation to close the record. Um, Back in 2014, we were at 47% delinquency rate, which means that almost half of our accounts that got discharged were incomplete, which is horrible. Um, we are now at 23%, so that's been a 51% reduction. Next slide. So DNFB dollars, we have a $2.4 million improvement in cash flow. We had a 61% reduction in total DNFB dollars. We had a 55% reduction in the physician portion and an 83% reduction in coding portion. So as you can see, this application really helped the coders with their workflow and their productivity. We went from having 4 million outstanding at any given time to 1.5 million. Um, what's really great about this is that it has been sustained and it's just continuous improvement. Um, it's still improvement. It's still improving to this day. So um, next slide. And it had an immediate impact on efficiency. So we went from the DNFB taking us eight hours to complete to 30 minutes a day. And um, that's a 96% improvement. So now we're able to complete this daily rather than once every two weeks, which works out better for coders and physicians to get that information to them timelier. All right, next slide. Okay, this is my turn again. Thanks, Mickey. <clears throat> yeah, no, inaccurate analytic data has no real value in, in a sense and can really cause problems when you're trying to improve, which signifies change. And so being able to access and clarify uh, data that drives change, what is that data? How, how often can you access it? How much can you trust it in sharing it with your physicians so that they become engaged and stay engaged. It's believable data, you know, not waiting for some old report from somewhere and then trying to figure out what's happened between the time you got the report and the current time you're looking at it. All of those things um, are overcome through what we've described here, at least for us they were, by improved analytics, improved processes, more accountability, which is all, always a factor, and that equals sustained success. I'll just offer this also the, I changed who reported to whom. So previously the uh, senior, senior person who was over this area is a nurse, chief quality person. And I, I put this under our uh, CIO. And then we made the change at the department level. Nikki, the other person is still with us, doing pretty well. Uh, and then brought in this analytics and process improvement. And we we're familiar with that and we had worked on that. And that was the frustrating part. When you know you can improve and have seen improvements and accomplished, frankly, many of them throughout the organization and not get the results here that we wanted to get. So 
all in all, those those characteristics come into play, and you saw the results: about two and a half million increase in cash flow, and then those have been sustained. I think that's that's really important. Uh, sustainable process improvement is what we all want to get that performance up on a high level and keep it there. So I would take questions and answers at this point, I think, Sarah, if anybody has any. All right. Well, actually, I'm going to run this final poll question and then we'll dive right into that Q&A. Okay. All right. While today's topic was an educational webinar focused on using analytics to improve key financial metrics, some of you may want to know more about Health Catalyst products or professional services. If you would like to learn more, please answer this poll question. We're going to leave that open as we dive into the Q&A. We have had a good amount of questions coming in already. <clears throat> Our first question comes from Tom, who asks, what is the percent transactions in dollars of DNFB over total AR? Can you, can, okay, can you say that again? Yeah. It, what percent of DNFB over total, what is the percent of DNFB over total AR? Oh. I hesitate to say I know what, I, I, what a day of uh, AR is, and I, I, I really don't want to give an inaccurate answer. Uh, oh, geez. <clears throat> Yeah, I can't give a clear answer on that. We can get that information to you later if you'll just let us know how we can contact you. We can share it with you, Sarah. And All right. Share it with yep, no worries. Okay, our next question comes from Mark who asks, uh, does your health system use Epic for your EMR or what EMR do you use is really what they want to know. We're a Meditech facility. Meditech. We've been Meditech now for... Two years. 2004? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 04. All right. Another one from Mark who asks, and the reporting that you're showing, is that embedded in your EMR or is it outside of the EMR in a visualization tool? So he's no, just kind outside. of, oh, sorry, can it, it, It's outside of the EMR. It, it pulls data from within the EMR, but it is outside of the EMR. Okay. And this next question actually, oh, go for it, Greg. Yeah, if I could, I'm sorry I didn't interrupt you. So one of the things that's been helpful with with, uh, with with this whole thing is that we were able to acquire a data warehouse five years ago, and uh, you know we have. I think that what's been done here in developing the apps is just pretty marvelous. We've we've been able to. Uh, pull data from just virtually any source and any kind of data, and it's instantaneous. It has prior history of data, and it can pull it up and train it and do a million things. And for example, we have a cost explorer where we can go into a room with our doctors and then eight different buckets of cost, OBGNs, whatever it is, sit down with them and say, look, here's the variation and so on. Mm -hmm. So this was similar to that and part of that. Yeah. Okay. And this, yeah, this next question kind of tied in with that. So you probably already sort of answered this. This was from Dusty who asked, you know, where does Health Catalyst obtain the data for the DNFB? Is is it coming from the Meditech stored data repository? It is. It's all coming from Meditech. Okay. And for other applications, we pull data from other sources. Yes, too. but yes. For this one specifically, it's, it's it can all be pulled through Meditech. And I... I'm not trying to toot Health Catalyst horn, but one of the things mm -hmm. that was appealing to me originally when we went with Health Catalyst was they understand process improvement. And you get in a room with a bunch of physicians, a lot of them here at least, and I think in many places don't really understand the principles and practices of, of process improvement. Some do, some are really good at it, but to have a company that you can work with that inherently they understand it and they understand the value of it. And then you have the analytics. Analytics, it's, uh, it's a great way to go. We always love to hear that. Um, well, <laughs> well, our next question is from Tom again, who asks, how much of DNFB was billed and collected rather than written off? So is he, uh, does he mean 
currently or in the past? We don't, we try not to write off anything in the past. Um, also, we try not to write off anything. So we would code it even if it was, if we didn't have the documentation, we code to the lowest level. I mean, um, it was minimal. It was minimal then and it's minimal now. All right. Although I can remember in the past a couple times that, you know, we missed deadlines and we had to just, as far as coding was concerned, that we had to just write them off, which never happens now. <clears throat> All right, here's a little different question. This is from Melissa. She asks, how do you consolidate paper and electronic documentation? <laughs> so, we are so now we are almost fully electronic um our only paper is i think admit orders and then um things from other facilities so it's a lot easier now but um at the time we had 3m and we had the um we would scan everything into meditech and i mean the um the main things that we were pulling the main documentation that we were pulling things from was electronic. Uh, we've been electronic with our um, our dictated reports from physicians and our um, imaging reports and things like that. We've been electronic for some time now. So so the, the, the paper records and everything, we really had to, as far as the DNV is concerned, we had to just say, is a paper there? So like if, if the, if the um, account was missing an order, the system could track if a paper was scanned in, which would have been the order. So it would say, yes, a paper is there, basically. So um, as far as the validity of the order, at the beginning, that was a little tougher to determine. And then, like I said, as we went on, we were able to build that into the system. Okay. Our next question comes from Jagdish, who asks, how do you deal with physicians who are always behind on their charts and their charges creating the DNFB? Do you submit charges first and allow them to finish their notes later? No, we we hold it until they do it. And, and what's really helped for us is that this application, we have the amount of money that they are holding up. So basically, we have the patient information and we have how much money is being held up. And just being able to show them that has helped tremendously prior to this application we would call them and say these you know these accounts are incomplete and we need we need your documentation to be able to code them they didn't truly understand the impact until they until they can see wow i'm holding up a hundred thousand dollars you know i better do my stuff you know and that's really really helped and honestly i can't even think of a physician who holds up consistently a lot on the DNFB because um, when we get with them and show them where they're holding up, it's it's usually. But it also enables you and us to show these same numbers in a, in a you know results or lack of results in a manner at a medical records committee and yes. C level and board level. We we had a, a board member, he's a retired college president. <clears throat> For some reason, he kind of got on this. We bring it to the board level, and then the chief of staff, vice chief, are sitting in the, the board meeting, and it helps also. You know, there's a little bit of heat that's put on accountability achieved there. So in the past, when we have had issues, we've, you know, we've printed it out and shown how much money's being held up. We bring we bring that to the medical records committee. Um, they can escalate that to higher committees, MEC, yeah, the MEC board, and at the board board level, level um, and then it gets taken that, care of from that's there. That's too. Yeah. It's not just Mickey by herself. Yep. <laughs> I'm glad to know you're not doing all this alone, Mickey. That would be a heavy load. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this next question comes from Bianca, who asks, what is your process for abstraction slash coding validation uh, when it comes to billing, and how has that evolved over the last few years? So, we have a scrubber and I'm not, this is not my area, so I can't talk too much into this, but we do have a scrubber that, um, that every claim goes through and it gets kicked out if, if something's not accurate. Um, 
Also, we, we have internal audits regularly. We have inter internal audits monthly, and we provide education from there. Um, we used to have external audits, but we were actually able to take that in-house when we went live with this application because it freed up so much time um, spent working on this that uh, we were able to bring that in. So, um, so yeah, that's how we... Um, I think that answered the question. Okay. The next question comes from Jason and he has a few questions nested in here. He asks, <laughs> can you say what other org structure changes you considered and what tipped that decision for you? Has there been any misalignment between quality and coding since the change? No, okay, let's see, make sure we understand the question. Misalignment between quality and coding. Well, first she said what tipped the the org. Did yeah. you read any other organizational? You can read the question again. Yeah, so maybe I'll just break it into those separate parts. So the first part was kind yeah. of the, can you say what other organizational structure changes you considered and what sort of tipped that decision for you? Well, I, from my viewpoint, we looked at it, and as I said, worked on it for some time. So it was... Really, I think the key thing there was that people, especially one in charge, was stuck on looking at numbers and things and not improving processes. Process improvement is critical, you know, to make meaningful changes. Those are, as we said, that are sustained especially. Those are the real ones. Those are the ones that matter. And engage the physicians in a different way. And so, um, there weren't a lot of other organizational changes, however, around the surrounded that whole thing. It was really two. One the person that reports to me and one the report the person that reported to her. That's Mickey's role. And you know, Mickey did a great job of, of engaging the docs and using these tools and leveraging them and brought a real positive approach to it. They responded well to it. And she was the CIO and he supported her. And uh, it was a great, you know, just a, a leap forward for us in that area. All right. And then the second the second half of that question, so I must still be referencing, you know, those changes you made to your organizational structure. So since you've implemented that, has there been any misalignment between quality and coding since you made that changeover? No, what's happened is we felt like our case mix index was not properly re reflected. We don't want anything unethical at all that we're doing here. And yet we have to represent ourselves the best we can so we get paid properly and provide the quality of care necessary for, you know, the level of acuity of the patient. So uh, we, we felt the documentation was insufficient. What What's happened is uh, some, some real improvements to that using these same processes. So you all, everybody knows, I think, that you start improving things, there's a lot of other great stuff that can happen. And our case mix index, Mickey, went from 1.6 to 1.85 um, yep. during since that time frame, the last year or two, two years. So that's a real significant factor also, and that's also been sustained. And we also work very closely with our quality department. Um, our, our CDI specialist and our quality um, our case management, they work together um, constantly on the documentation, the quality side of things, making sure that the documentation is there if there is any quality measures that are being questioned. All right. Our next question comes from Lucy, who asks, how do you quantify the impact? And I take that to mean, you know, what kinds of metrics are you specifically looking at to determine your levels of success with these process changes? So the slides that I showed, we actually, we report those metrics. We follow that monthly. So that's really, those were our greatest areas of impact and that's what we keep an eye on um, monthly. Are there more refined breath. discharge not final build metrics, more refined than what we had before? Uh, easily they are because they, they're more easily, um, they're more easily obtainable. Um, so we, we have the, the broad view in these graphs, 
And then if there is an area where we feel that we're struggling, we can drill down and then we can start reporting that until we figure it out. So basically, if we see that um, we have a, a large number of outpatient records that are staying on the DNFB, so we can start drilling down into, okay, what location are these outpatient records coming from? What physician? I mean, that can we can start reporting that on a monthly basis until we figure out what's going on and, and put some action in place behind it. All right. This next question comes from Bianca again, who asks, what strategy have you found is most effective regarding clinical documentation improvement and how has it impacted not only the bottom line for your organization, but the workflow of your HIM department uh, when it comes to coding and billing? So we use lots of strategies within clinical documentation improvement, but one thing that I feel very strongly about is having your clinical documentation improvement um, people on the floor, having them visible so the doctors can actually talk to them while they're rounding, um, having them educate the doctors right there on the floor. I don't, I see a lot of facilities going to remote CDI and I just don't feel like that's the best way to educate our physicians. Um, so I mean, if I could, Nikki, too, we, we've used some different models. One where, where these, these folks were attached to certain doctors. Mm -hmm. Each of them had several doctors that they followed exclusively. Then we went to one where they just, it was more cardiology or whatever mm -hmm. type of care it may be. And that didn't go as well with the doctors. We thought that'd be an improvement. We went back to sort of one-on-one -on -one with the doctor you were assigned to. And the queries, why don't we talk about that too for a moment, how that's helped. Okay, so we, we recently, well, within the last year, we went to electronic queries. And they, the queries actually pop up right in the physician's workflow. So as he is documenting on the patient, the question from the, the CDI actually pops up and they can respond right then and there. Their response gets shot to the chart as a progress note. That has helped tremendously. Um, they can do that from anywhere. They can document from their office and they, they're able to still communicate with the CDI. Um, so that has been a huge help. Um, I'm trying to think what else. We do report to the physicians. We, we show them their stats on how many queries they answered that month, how many um, they agreed with and things like that. And we, we don't push for them to agree with us. I mean, we'll never say you didn't agree enough. You know, we just show them that just to see. But the response rate, we do push that they have a over 85% response rate. So that's something that we do take very seriously. And if we see a physician is falling behind on their response rate, I do contact them personally and see what we can do to, to get that response rate up. Um, and we even bring to committees if, if needed to the, get that escalated. The percent of queries is not as high as we'd like it to be either. The it's percent of respon the yes. response rate, yes. yes. It's not as high. It's a, it's a hassle, honestly. And there's a little group internal medicine guys are kind of recalcitrant. They just don't, they don't want to do it. They generally buck all those things, but I know everybody has them. So we're not unique in that sense, but we have moved that curve and, and we're getting better, better results there uh, across the board. I don't know if we answered her question. <laughs> her question. We also do have a, an application we use for case mix index um, that's similar to the DNFB application. Um, and it does allow us to see areas of opportunity um, by DRG, by provider. Um, you can pull out all kind of information and that does help us to, to show what we should be focusing on. And we have monthly lunch and learns for the physicians providing education. Um, we try to be creative when, you know, and convenient for them when providing the education. All right, this next question comes from Dusty who asks, has Health Catalyst built other dashboards for you besides this one that you're using for the DNFB? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we, have, uh, we started what we call care, care transformation five years ago. And <clears throat> I'm not clinical, but I was the one that brought it in here because I felt like 
we had to go outside the regular medical staff committees and things um, to get to really move the dial. So it's a triple aim, cost, quality, and patient experience. And, you know, we populated, created these teams, all physician-led. And then what we do is we, the other thing that was appealing to me is we bring doctors who, we, we selected care families after an analysis of where the best opportunities were. And mostly on cost and quality, our patient stats are really pretty high and have been for a long time. We, that's serious stuff to us. So, but, but we could still improve it. It was there, but it was really, really how do we take our costs out? How do we take the waste out of clinical care and improve the quality? I think some people don't think you can do that. I liked what El Callis has said and, and uh, some of the doctors associated with them, uh, <clears throat> the inverse relationship between cost and quality. Better the quality, the lower the cost, and, and the opposite is true. So, um, for one of the first times, we started being able to sit down with our doctors and put those things together. Along the way, we would send the physicians out to Salt Lake City, and they'd spend a week or so out there. I think there's three sessions um, that were designed to introduce them to all these things and how they could drive it across the spectrum, not in a narrow way. We brought our ER doctors in there and very much integrated in them because there were there were a lot to do with it and so on. And the whole change, you know, the whole change thing happened there where denial and the whole process of coming to a point where you accept change. But we developed dashboards for each area that we went after, like sepsis. And, you know, the variation was real clear abundantly clear, the cost was abundantly clear by physician, and we could actually sit down and start concretely talking about why, why is there this variation. We could get accountability at, the, at, at a pretty high level, and we brought our doctors. We'd go to like one family doctor group, has eight docs in it, and, and discuss with them what we were trying to do and show them the dashboard and, and so on, all the way to the board to, to the staff to everybody. So I don't know how many dashboards we have now. It's quite a few. We also use it for other things. We're developing one right now for the wellness center. These are analytics that I want to have about how we're helping people move the dial. We have a lot of fantastic stories. You know, the extraordinary ones we lost 115 pounds. Several of our staff have done that. But that's, that's you know, out on the edge of the curve. So how do we aggregate, how do we get, get that data, how do we aggregate it, how can we continue to improve? And they're helping us right now put that, uh, that together. I probably said that's a long answer. <laughs> that's a long. Well, actually, our, our next question kind of ties into that, and maybe you've already answered it, but Beth was asking, you know, how did you find and then decide that Catalyst could help you with your specific issues that you were facing? And you kind of addressed that, just if you have any other comments. Yeah, well, I had known Brent James. I actually got him to come down here in, in the 90s, and I always considered him a smart guy. <laughs> in, in what we're talking about. And he could bring it all the way to the insurance market. And I felt like we had to go in that direction. And so, you know, over the years, we'd, we'd go, I'd talk with him, and he'd give me some advice. He was great about sharing time with me. But when it came down to what are we going to do here, um, there was IBM. I talked to CEOs that were using them and others for the analytics. And the part for me that was missing was what I just said. It was, it was process improvement. And so you can have your own if you're smart. Well, there's a lot of hospitals pretty smart about that now. But uh, if you the analytics by themselves, I don't believe just move the dial for you. That's just my opinion. You can look at numbers all day long, but what what really helps you improve? You take your our sepsis mortality rate now. It's, we had it down to four. It's up back up around seven now, but I still think the national average is 20 or above the mortality rate. And our cost for sepsis, our cost, took a day and a half I think, to stay off our ICU for sepsis patients. Stuff like that are incredible. 
uh, deductions and costs. Uh, while our neighbors are all losing money, we're still making money. And, you know, we, we have cash to do things. Our futures, it's not a slam dunk, but we're in a better position to survive and thrive. So, <clears throat> um, I, I just think clinical process improvement here, but now you've got in the cost, our cost of doing business piece is, uh, it was one of the breaking points for me personally. All right. And we are almost at the top of the hour. If anyone has any burning questions that they still have, please do submit those. We just have about one left uh, at this point, which is perfect for ending at the top of the hour. Uh, so this question, again, is from Tom, who, who would like to know more about your payer mix. What percent are government payers? He just wants to know a little bit more about that. Medicare is about 54%. Medicaid is about 19%. Um, commercial insurance and bad debt make up the rest. Our contractual adjustments are pretty high, I think. Um, you know, it's just, it's just it's, it's, it's a really slim area to, to have an operating margin. Okay. Well, it looks like that's going to do it for the Q&A. So we want to thank Greg and Mickey for taking the time to present to us today. It's really impressive to see the results you guys have achieved, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And we also want to thank everyone uh, who's still on the line for joining us today. Please do us a favor and complete the short survey as you exit the presentation. Your answers will help us to deliver more valuable content in the future. We'd also like to invite you to join us for our next webinar, which will be on February 27th, in which Jason Jones, who is our chief data scientist here at Health Catalyst, will dive into the world of predictive models. As a reminder, shortly after this webinar, you will receive an email with links to an on-demand recording, the presentation slides, and a transcription. On behalf of Greg, Mickey, and all of us here at Health Catalyst, thank you for joining us today. This webinar is now concluded.